Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. Uh, I hate to begin with an apology, but I'm suffering from a little bit of summer allergies here. So if you notice a difference in my voice, and I hope that uh, I can uh, keep my throat clear during the presentation today. Uh, you probably remember that we're in the book of Job in session 3, chapters 15 through 21. And we're continuing a, uh, a, a line of discussion here between Job and his three friends. I want you to remember that these three friends uh, are adherents to an Old Testament theology that basically goes like this. Blessing and prosperity equals righteousness. Suffering and loss equals unrighteousness and punishment for a person who has who is been sinful. So here in this section in 15 through 21, we're going to see a second round of debate between Job and the, the three friends who've come supposedly to, to comfort him. Turns out that that's not really what they're, they're wanting to do. I want you to, to look at this description here that, that comes from the layman's commentary. Chapter 15. Chapter 15 begins the second round of debates between Job and his three friends. All three friends have hoped that their verbal chastening would bring Job to his senses and make him repent. In the second round, however, the focus turns from redemption to destruction. The friends change from constructive criticizers to judgment jurors, de determined to find Job guilty of the alleged sins that have caused his suffering. Isn't that interesting how, how so often that when people offer suggestions to you and then a little criticism to you, that it, it becomes something that becomes more destructive than it does uh, something that's nurturing uh, in helping someone out. And that's what happens here with Job. And Job then is a, really a demolished person there, seems to be a demolished person, pleading for a defender, someone to vindicate him in the presence of his friends because Job doesn't understand this. And we remember the story here about the, the, the meeting between uh, God and, and, and Satan and what God allowed Satan to do because he said, consider my uh, servant Job. And, and Satan said, oh, if you just take this stuff away from him, if you inflict disease on him, he's going to curse you. And uh, so far we find out that that's not so. Satan is wrong. So let's begin and look at the first verses here in chapter 15. And remember, as we go through here, we won't look at every verse. There's far too many for us to cover in the amount of time that we have allotted. So we want to look at the first six verses in chapter 15. It begins this way. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, replied, Would a wise man answer the empty notions or fill his belly with the hot east wind? Would, would he argue with useless words with speeches that have no value? But you even undermine piety and hinder devotion to God. Your sin prompts your mouth. You adopt the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, not mine. Your own lips testify against you. Now when Eliphaz accuses Job of filling his belly with hot east wind, he's making a specific reference here. There is a wind that blows in that part of the world that's called the Sirocco. And it comes directly off the desert uh, from the east and it brings no moisture. In fact, it dries everything up. It parches the ground. There's nothing good about the Sirocco. So he says, Job, you're full of hot air just like the Sirocco. And what you're saying is just like what the Sirocco brings to us. It, it, it's, it's not beneficial for anything. All you're doing is drying out the situation. You're parching the ground. The implication is that Job has spoken in a violent and irreverent way rather than adopting the pious uh, stance that these three friends have. He's gone off on a, uh, on, on a tangent. And so Elevaz uh, turns an often used te debate technique against Job. He says, your own, your own words, your own words convict you. They condemn you. And, and if you just examine them, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. Eliphaz implies that Job's questioning of God's motives proved that he deserved the punishment that he received because you shouldn't question God. 
Now let's move on and look at verses 7 through 11 uh, where uh, he, he continues and he really tries to put Job down. He says, Are you the first man ever born? Were you brought forth from the hills? Do you listen in on God's counsel? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What insights do you have that we do not have? The gray-haired and the aged are on our side, men even older than your father. Are God's consolations not enough for you, words spoken gently to you? Essentially, they're saying, Job, who do you think you are? Are, are, are you so important that, that you consider yourself to be the first person ever born? You don't have anybody to look to for experience, uh, uh, that you were there before the hills were even formed? Uh, you, you're, you're getting too big for your britches, Job. You're, you're not, you're not uh, the, the most important person here in the world. In, in verses 7 through 9, he asks all those questions of Job. And those questions are saying, Job, you're arrogant. You're, you're, you're adopting a stance that puts you above everyone else who's been wise in the past. And even the, the old men would say, that's wrong. You're wrong to be doing that. And if we skip down to, uh, to, to verse 20 uh, of Job uh, 15, uh, it reads, All his days the wicked man suffers torment, the ruthless through all the years stored up for him. Terrifying sounds fill his ears. When all seems well, marauders attack him. He despairs of escaping the darkness. He is marked for the sword. He wanders about, food for vultures. He knows the day of darkness is at hand. Distress and anguish fill him with terror. They overwhelm him like a king poised to attack. He's describing Job's fate. And he's, he's saying, Job, uh, you're going you're gonna to writhe in pain all your days. You're going you're gonna to end up becoming paranoid and die. You cannot escape this. You cannot escape the misfortune. In fact, you're going to have to go around and wander and scavenge for food. And on top of that, the vultures are going to be scavenging you the, for their own food. Uh, and so you, you have to be, uh, uh, you're going to be in fear all of these days. And he continues in verse 25 and, and, and verses that follow that, uh, because he shakes his fist at God and vaunts himself against the Almighty, defiantly charging against him with thick, a thick strong shield. He will inhabit ruined towns and houses where no one lives, houses crumbling to rubble. He will no longer be rich and his wealth will not endure nor will his possessions spread over the land. And then skipping down to verse 32, before his time he will be paid off in full and his branches will not flourish. He will be like a vine stripped of its unripe grapes, like an olive tree shedding its blossoms. Eliphaz is listing the reasons for Job's suffering here. Or if any evil person charging Job, you're guilty on all counts. You oppose God in the same way that a warrior might. You armed yourself and you charged against God with a heavy shield. Uh, your wealth did not endure because you made bad investments. You invested in the wrong things. Uh, you will produce no wealth because God's going to punish you for your sins. He's going to strip everything from you. His existence may be summed up in the lot of an ungodly people. It is barren and filled with mischief and lies. And that's your future, Job. That's what's going to happen to you. Now there's a chance for Job to reply in chapter 16. And you, you hear Job's frustration here. You hear Job's wonder, what, what's wrong here, God? Look in verse 1. He says, Then Job replied, I've heard many things like these, miserable comforters are you all. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? He says, you're not comforters for me. You're miserable comforters. You make me feel worse. Uh, this, this is not the kind of comfort that someone in my position is looking for. He's, if you were in my place, I could talk that way to you too. But in my situation, I see things differently than you do. And you would see them my way if you were, if you were in my situation. 
And then in uh, verse 12, he says, All was well with me, but he, God, shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He made me his target. His archers surrounded me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he burst upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping and deep shadows ring my eyes. Yet my hands have been free of violence and my prayer is pure. Even though God has done all of these things to me. I mean, he, he says God's treated me like we're in a battle. He's had archers to pierce me. He, he's had people uh, to, to disembowel me, basically. And, and he said, I, I'm sitting here in sackcloth and ashes and my skin is in terrible position. Uh, but, and so I, I, I just can't uh, get through all of this. My hands have been free from violence and my prayers have been pure. He said, I hadn't done anything wrong. My prayers have been pure. I, anytime I've had a sin, I confessed it. But I, I, I'm pure in this situation. He's a completely broken man here in verses 12 through 17 who believe that God's made him a target. And he's been, uh, he, he uses the forceful imagery here uh, that's so prevalent in, in Job that he seized him by the neck. He surrounded him with attackers. His vital organs have been slashed open. He... Job's defending his innocence as best he can, but he, he can't find a place to go here. He, he can't find anybody on his side. He really hopes for somebody who will be on his side. And he expresses that in the verses that follow here in verses 18. I want you to look uh, as we read this. There's some, there's some words here that are very important. He says, O earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend as my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of a man, he pleads with God as a man pleads for his friend. Only a few years will pass before I go on the journey of no return. Job's pleading here. He, he's pleading uh, that, that his blood remain on the ground so that, 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 that the Hebrews believe that, that shed blood... Uh, would cry out from the ground on behalf of the victim and would, would continue to do that until that person's death was avenged. Job's not dead, but what he's asking for here is, a, is someone to plead his case, someone to come before God to, to establish his innocence. He's asking for a witness in heaven. Notice he says, my witness in heaven. That's the first time that he comes to the place where he says, you know, I think my only hope's with God. And I'm going to have to have somebody to come in. He's already said I need an umpire or I need an intercessor. I need an arbitrator. He says, I need a witness in heaven. Uh, but he can't understand why God, God himself doesn't witness for him. And he's looking for God to do that. Now, we'll go down to, to chapter 17. And beginning with verse 1, he says this. My spirit is broken, my days are cut short, the grave awaits me. Surely mockers surrounded me, my eyes must dwell on their hostility. Give me, O oh God, the pledge you demand. Who else will put up security for me? You have closed their minds to understanding, therefore you will not let them triumph. He's broken, he's a defeated man, and he's pleading with God. Don't let these accusers of mine be the ones who triumph. Uh, he says, I'm, I'm defeated, uh, and, and I, all I can look forward to is, is the grave. And so he says to God, I want you to put up a pledge for me. That's terminology in the Old Testament, which is tantamount to saying, God, would you pay bail for me so I can get out from underneath this until it is resolved? I need, I need some help here. He knew that nobody else would take his side. Uh, all, all of the... Uh, all of his friends were against him. They testified against him. He says, I need you to put up bail for me, God, and, and, and help me in this. He said believe, he believed that God had afflicted him, but he still thought God would treat him more justly than his friends had treated him. So he's asking God, he said, I need you to give witness that I'm right. 
So he's establishing the fact that he thinks his witness is going to be God. Now move down to chapter 18, and uh, this opens with uh, really uh, the friends demonstrating that they're, they're qualified. Uh, they're intelligent. They're, they're successful. Uh, they're, they're all people that folks would look to and say, these are wise people. Uh, and so uh, Job accuses them uh, of not being qualified. And uh, he said, I can't find a wise man among you. And, and that strikes a sensitive nerve with these uh, three that have gathered there. And so Bildad takes up the challenge. And he, he has no intention of letting that matter drop. And his response to Job reveals how defensive and how, how sensitive they were to what he said that, that he couldn't find a wise man among them because they all believe themselves to be wise. Look at what we've been able to do and how we've been able to prosper. So Bildad says this in uh, chapter 18, verse 1. Then Bildad the Shuhite replied, When will you end these speeches? Be sensible and then we can talk. Why are we regarded as cattle and considered stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself to pieces in your anger, is the earth to be abandoned for your sake or must the rocks be moved from their place? We could paraphrase what he says here uh, in these first four verses by saying, look who has called us stupid. You, you, not your friends, expect God to change the order of the universe just for your benefit? Everything doesn't revolve around you, Job. Uh, you, you've acted stupidly yourself, and, and you can't expect God to, to do this. And then uh, in ver beginning in verse 5 and then several verses uh, out of uh, chapter 18, not necessarily in order, the lamp or the wicked of the wicked is snuffed out. The flame of his fire stops burning. The light in his tent becomes dark. The lamp beside him goes out. The vigor of his step is weakened. His own schemes throw him down. A noose is hidden for him in the ground. A trap lies in his path. He is torn from the security of his tent and marched off to the king of terrors. The memory of him perishes from the earth. He has no name in the land. He has no offspring or descendants among his people. No survivor where he once lived. He says, Job, here, here's, here's where you are. Uh, one of the symbols that, uh, symbolisms that's used here is the idea of a light in the tent. When the light in the tent goes out, it signifies that the, that the prosperity has ended. If there's light in the tent, there's prosperity. He says, Job, everything's dark for you. The light in the tent has gone out. That shows disfavor in God's eyes. He says, surely the fate of the evil and of you, Job, surely the fate of you, it would be ruin, disaster, and annihilation. So, so, so don't, don't talk about me. This is all about you, Job. It's not, it's not about me at all. And so we go down to chapter 19 and Job replies to Bildad's accusations. Uh, in chapter 19 and beginning in verse 1, and there'll be some verses that are skipped here, Job replies, how long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Ten times now you have reproached me. If it is true that I have gone astray, my, my error remains my concern alone. Then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. He has alienated my brothers from me. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my brothers. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. Now we're beginning the focal passage of the lesson, if you've been following in your literature. The focal passage is chapter 19. Great, great passages in the book of Job, as you'll see. And so Job is claim, claiming sinless perfection. He may have erred, but he has a clear conscience and no, no awareness of his sin such as might have caused his suffering. But he realizes what his condition is too. 
He's been reproached by his friends over and over. He says 10 times. That's, that's simply a figurative language to say that you, you've, you've reproached me over and over. I get the, I get the message. I, I understand what you're saying. He says on top of all that, he says, God has wronged me. He, he's wronged me. He's placed me in confinement. He's hemmed me in. And, and, and I can't do anything to defend myself. Even, even God has stripped me of my honor and he's counted me among his enemies. Breaks Job's heart that that's happened to him. He feels like he's a city under siege and there's no way out. He's surrounded and the enemy's building siege towers uh, to, to take him in. I, I, these sentences here at the last are, are sometimes amusing, if you will. He says, my wife says I have bad breath and, and even little boys make fun of me. He, he's... He's in a terrible, terrible predicament. Look in verse 19. He says, All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. He said, I'm at an end. I'm hanging by a thread here. There, there's, there, there's nothing really that can save me. One commentator has written that Job's friends might write this following epitaph for his gravestone. Here lies Job, who was a sinner with secret sins he refused to confess. He has paid the penalty for his sins at last, and the justice of God has been vindicated by his death. May he not rest in peace. And the, his friends, Job thinks, they want his, his, his punishment to follow him even to the grave. And Job shifted his focus from the anguish that's caused by his friends uh, to his own personal suffering here. Uh, he's holding on for dear life. He says, I'm holding on by the skin of my teeth. Narrowly, narrowly escaped his own death. It's amazing, considering the intensity of this trial, that Job still even has his bearings about him. I mean, you'd, you'd expect someone like that to be totally incoherent. Job's not incoherent. He realizes what his situation is. And so he turns to his friends in verse 21, and he says this. He says, have pity on me, my friends. Have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never forget of my flesh, enough of my flesh? Here, Job is looking to who he's called miserable comforters. They might be miserable comforters, but they're still his friends. And he said, take pity on me. Uh, he wanted them to recognize what his plight was and that he says it's resulted from God's hands, not his sin. Uh, so what would it take to satisfy you? I'm going to take just a minute and look at this accusation that Job makes that it's, it's resulted from God's hands. Uh, one of the commentators that I, that I read is a man named Christopher Ashe, and I thought he had a, a good take on this. Uh, Christopher Ashe urges us to pause here and consider whether Job has actually made the correct assessment. He refers us back to chapter 1 where Satan says to God, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. However, God says, no, this, this is not something I'm going to do. He says, behold, he is in your hand. So it's Satan's hands. It's, it's the hands and fingers of Satan that destroyed Job's possessions, killed Job's children, wrecked Job's health. The only thing is that God's placed limitations on him. He's given him permission, but there's strict limitations. He can't take Job's life. He can get right up to that point, but he can't take Job's life. Paul writes that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Uh, Satan is a, he is a, he's a wicked and crafty character. You have to watch out for him. And that's what, that's what Job uh, is, is saying here, that it's the hands of, of God, but really it was the hands of Satan. The question raised by Job was why his friends continued their relentless pursuit of him. He, he's really asking, when, when is enough enough? Uh, the, the question he directs to, to both his friends and really to God as well. Uh, he, they've, they've, he thought, you've had enough. G g give me a break here. Not only do his friends continue to debate him, but God also uh, would challenge him later. And God's not come through yet to defend Job, Job thinks. Now, here's the truth of the book of Job and the character of the book of Job. 
We're going to find that in, in verses 23 through 29. Because Job turns toward God, he's going to say something that has real conviction. It's for posterity's sake. He hopes these words will be put in the book, he'll say, written in a scroll. And up until now, he's been uncertain, but now he's got some degree of certainty. Because in verse 25, he'll assert, I know that my Redeemer lives. And what he's referring to here is a goel, as out of uh, the, the, the Hebrew, like Boaz, who defend the property of the kinsman. Job is saying, my vindicator is going to take care of me. So look in verses 23 and following. He says, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in a rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job is expressing a desire here for his words to be recorded. He wants to be recorded in the Bible. He says in a scroll. His desire was for his words to stand as a monument to be preserved, to give wisdom to other people who are faced with his circumstances. Then in a flash of light as brilliant as the noonday sun, one writer says, Job exclaims, but I know that my Redeemer lives. His words here are emphatic. In fact, every word in that verse is emphatic. The but is more than a conjunction. It, it introduces verse 25 as something different from what's gone on before. It's almost like the light bulb has gone off in Job's head. He says, yes, I know. I know now. I understand. In effect, Job said, I could wish that my case to be written in a book or on a rock, but there's something better than that, namely a living redeemer. Despite everything that happens to, has happened to him, Job is saying, Aha, I know. I know that my redeemer lives. I know that he lives and on this earth again shall stand. He says, here's the most quoted verse in Job. He is saying that he, he has experiential knowledge, not just intellectual knowledge. Experiential knowledge means that you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death like the psalmist had. Not that you read about it or somebody told you about it. That's intellectual knowledge. You have actually experienced it. Job says, all this I've been through, I experienced it and I know now. I know who my Redeemer is. It's the Old Testament concept here of the kinsman redeemer. But it's going to go farther than that. The redeemer may come to aid of a relative in distress over property, but this is the evolution of something much greater in faith history. Uh, later in the book of Ruth, uh, Boaz becomes a kinsman redeemer. God is referred to as redeemer in several Old Testament passages in Psalms and Isaiah and in Exodus, God redeemed His people from slavery in Egypt. All these images together paint a picture that points to Christ, the Messiah, the heavenly witness that Job has been talking about, the person who's going to stand between him and God. Was Job speaking of a human or divine vindicator? He's, he's talking about uh, someone who's going to be more than an umpire, somebody who's going to be more than an intercessor. He's going to be his heavenly witness. He's advanced the concept to a living redeemer, a vindicator, someone who is going to stand in between him and God. The kind of redeemer that Job envisioned would have to be the one who would not die as he was about to, but one who would last forever. He would stand up on the earth it says, upon the dust, upon Job's grave even. Even after Job died, such a redeemer would usher him into the presence of God from his flesh and Job would see God. When you, when you think about this kind of redeemer, this idea uh, doesn't reach its real fullest expression until we get to 
the, the Redeemer of the New Testament, Jesus Christ. Uh, but the concept is central to Job's hope. The first time he expressed it, he was looking for a mediator in chapter 9, verses 32 through 35. And then in verse, chapter 16, verses 19 through 21, he says, I need somebody to arbitrate for me. As New Testament believers, we understand that ultimately Jesus Christ is the mediator. He's the one who will plead our case before God. And wouldn't you want only Jesus to plead your case? Because Jesus is the one who's willing to pay the price. He'll pay the ransom for you. Job affirmed not only that God heard his cries, but also God would answer personally. It's not clear when, when Job believed this, uh, this meeting would take place. But the truth is that it would provide hope that after he was, his skin was destroyed, after his flesh was taken away, that as, as believers there would be a physical resurrection. Paul's words echo Job's words. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Job says, I myself will see with my own eyes. He's not talking of God vindicating him in, in after death. He's talking about God vindicating uh, him for himself. Most scholars say that Job is not making a statement of afterlife. From his flesh, he'll see God's vindication. And I think he will by the end of the book. He'll understand what God's vindication is. For a moment, Job has arrived at the height of his faith. Job knows if he does not receive justice here, he will receive it in the hereafter. He's breaking new ground. In later speeches, he knows that vindication will come in the afterlife, but he wants some of that right now. Isn't that just like us? We want some of that vindication right now. Job knows by faith. He said that by faith that his Redeemer will at last stand upon the earth, literally upon the dust, upon his grave. It's better than a fading tombstone that would be inscribed with the vindication. Uh, this is an eternal vindication. It's a living vindicator who stands on Job's grave and he attests to the genuine and right relationship that Job had with God. The Redeemer must live in an absolute sense. The Redeemer must be eternal in nature. And he must be able to stand for Job as an equivalent before God who is Job's accuser and as a defense attorney he must be no less than eternal, and he must not be lower than God. There's only one person that fits that description. It's Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It is one of the deep ways in which the book of Job, like the whole Old Testament, ultimately does not make any sense without Christ and without God, who is in the Trinity. You know, the New Testament fills the Old Testament full of meaning, as my friend Waylon Bailey says. It fills the Old Testament full of meaning. Here we are. We have the New Testament. Job didn't have that yet. But we have the Old Testament, New Testament and the Old Testament. So our New Testament understanding fills the Old Testament full of meaning. And what a better meaning for us to understand, for, to understand about about our own situation, our Redeemer. Who's going to stand in the gap for us? It's going to be Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate Redeemer. He's the ultimate Vindicator. As we close, close out this section, there's just a little postscript here. The, the, the last two chapters in the section of our lesson, 20 and 21, uh, close and we find out that Zophar and his two companions simply will not believe that Job's suffering can be innocent and even redemptive. There is no place in their system of thinking either for, listen to this, undeserved suffering or undeserved grace. Isn't that what we have? Undeserved grace? Grace is, what get, is the gift that we have from God. For by grace have you been saved. It's a gift from God. It's not something you've done on your own. It, it is a, a grace that, that we can only, 
received through Jesus Christ. It's one of the deep ways in which the book of Job, like the whole Old Testament, ultimately does make sense uh, because of Jesus Christ. So Zophar and his two companions, they won't, they won't accept the fact of undeserved grace or undeserved suffering. What Job has discovered in chapter 19 is this. This is important. Is a redeemer who will not forsake him and one day will be his witness in heaven and stand in the gap for him when he appears before God's judgment seat. That's for Job. That's for Harry. That's for you. That's what Christ is going to do for us. As I thought about this, I thought about one of the great musical uh, pieces that I, I love to hear. Uh, when George Frederick Handel composed the Oratorio Messiah, he followed the Hallelujah course with a beautiful soprano solo based on Job 19, 25, and 26, set alongside the words of Paul to the Corinthians. Here's how the words go. Uh, it's repeated several times, but... I know that my Redeemer liveth and on the earth again shall stand. For now is Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. It is precisely the bodily resurrection of Christ that gives us the assurance that Job's confidence was not wishful make-believe, but a sure and certain hope. And so that hope that we all base our hope, the hope of Jesus Christ is sure and certain. And if you place your faith in Him, He will not let you down. Now, if you're thinking that I'm going to sing, I know that my Redeemer liveth, not today. Uh, if, if you would like to see a wonderful recording, just go up and if you're on YouTube, just put in the search section, I know that my Redeemer liveth slash Messiah, and you'll get several good choices. It'd be a wonderful thing to watch here after you've watched this lesson. And I pray that we, we all can come to that same realization that Job did. There is a vindicator, and it's Jesus Christ. And He's paid the price for us. And it's a gift to us if we just want to receive it. I pray that that's what you will do. Have a good week.